Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a television program. It's all designed to take you through the Bible, and we are doing that. It is very exciting. One of the people that helps us figure this out is Corey. Corey, what's up? Today, we are going to be taking a look at the flood of Noah, but from an ancient cultural standpoint, different memories from different cultures. All right, very good. I look forward to that. That's a good one. And what did you study today? Well, today we're talking talking about the Tower of Babel, and I just want to have a wee bit of a discussion about the idea surrounding the building of it. Very good. Excellent. Ryan, what's up? Today I'm looking at the claim made by skeptics that Genesis 10 and 11 contradict each other. All right, we'll talk about all of that still to come later on in the program. This is the first time that men made bricks and created a building. And we'll talk about why God reacted the way he did coming up as we teach in the segment. Get your Bible and your Bible guide out. Today, you and I are going to be examining the ancient flood of Noah, but we are going to be taking a look at uh surrounding ancient cultures, not just the ancient Hebrew culture, not just the biblical account of the flood, but what do other cultures say about a, a worldwide flood, an ancient flood or Noah? And you might be surprised to find out that there are many ancient cultures that record similar things. It is a striking fact that nearly all cultures around the world have an ancient global flood story. Cultures separated by race, language, thousands of miles, and even entire oceans contain within their seemingly separate cultural memories a terrible story of an ancient flood. Many have tried to explain this phenomena by pointing to an innate human fear of natural disaster. It is guessed that due to the common human experience of occasional local flooding that can be disastrous, that these cultures separately invented their flood mythologies. While true that local flooding has been and still is a common occurrence in many nations, and also that small stories or myths have a tendency to grow and change over millennia into something much more grand than how they started out, this theory has a tremendously difficult time explaining the small corresponding details between all of these myths. If all of these stories grew independently of one another, then why do so many of them refer to a one person or one family survival, the building of a large boat after a warning, the rescuing of the animals of Earth by this person or family, animals used to check the recession of the flood, the boat landing on a mountaintop, and the purpose of the flood being God's displeasure with activity on the planet. If all the flood stories were different, then a theory of their origin from localized flooding would be sound. But that isn't the case. These stories come from every part of the globe. Could it be that all of these myths represent an event that actually occurred? A common history would explain the similar subject matter, thematic themes, and specific details. The Bible claims that after the Tower of Babel, a great split of humanity occurred, each family branch leaving to find their own land. As time went on, culture and history developed, but they all carried with them a common early history of the Great Flood and the creation of the world. Now, a, a crucial aspect of uh, this ancient study, uh, looking at the different mythologies of a flood that needs to be pointed out, is that these, uh, these mythologies, these stories, these uh, preserved histories, legends, whatever you want to call them, they're different enough that uh, most scholars don't believe that they were copied from one another. Many of the cultures that contain, that have a flood uh, history, uh, story, legend, they 
there's actually no proof that they intersected or met up with or traded with a culture that has uh, a similar flood legend to theirs. So uh, this is this is something that's very puzzling uh, for uh, historians when when they go back. You know why why do these cultures that are separated by vast distances by times and the stories are different enough that it doesn't look like they copied from one another. Why do they all preserve the same kind of thing? A similar tale about, you know, a family or a man surviving a giant flood, being warned by a god to uh, build some sort of boat or ship. Now, uh, you know, interestingly here, when you start from the, the preposition of Genesis with Genesis as your worldview, this really does explain why cultures would have similar uh, memories, historical memories, because they all would have had the same history. And then at the Tower of Babel, they would have spread out and developed their histories in different ways. Now, there are different cultures and languages that exist in the world, not simply because people are where they are, but different locations actually have the same things available. Water, for example, and the land, and the moon, and the sun, and the stars at night. But the question remains, however, why do people differ in language and culture? It is a great exercise when studying places on planet Earth. The Bible explains why and shows us the different languages and how they came about. It all started with sin. That's right, sin, S-I-N. Now the tower was called Babel, a name synonymous with the destruction of man since the beginning of that time. And that destruction had to do with identification of other spiritual beings with plans to interrupt the image of God, mankind. Considering the Bible is truthful, the account of Babel becomes easier and seems ever more logical. Genesis 11 verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Genesis 11 verses 1 through 9. Genesis chapter 11. It is amazing what we look at as we consider the beginning of the books. This is the beginning of Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses. And this is going back in history to the beginning of Adam and Eve. We've looked at that. We've looked, of course, at the fall of man and the invention of murder. And then, of course, now Noah's flood. We looked at that last time. And today is something interesting as we consider the time of Abram. 
after Noah. Now, this is fascinating, and I need to remind you that if you don't have your Bible guide, why not? Write to us and ask for your Bible guide. If you're in the United States, write to the United States address or Canada, write to the Canadian address. Or if you're in the British Isles, you can write to the British address. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com and click on Donate, make a donation, and that keeps us alive, keeps the lights going and all that sort of thing, and get your guide sent to you, and it'll be, take you to a page where the PDF files are, and you can download them there. Very important. But today, as we think about this, we're going to consider something in works of faith that I believe is important. And I, I think about this every time I go to the store and I look at the milk carton or some other cartons, and I, I'm looking at a language that I don't understand. And I'm thinking, There's, what's the different languages. What's the deal with the languages? And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Why are the languages different? Why are we different languages? And, you know, we have scientists that come along and they say, well, you know, this guy, he does this and this guy does that. And why is that? So there's a question here that we need to consider because the cultures are different too. And that's something the Bible answers, beloved. It tells the truth. We're reading Genesis 10 to 11, and we're going to focus on looking at chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. We go to the scripture. And the scripture says in verses 1 to 4, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Well, that seems obvious, coming off of Noah's Ark and all of that. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Making bricks and baking them, huh? They had, uh, they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Now, you need to notice that because that's important, beloved. Buildings were constructed from bricks after the flood. Men began to identify themselves through the things they created. The things they create are going to make a name for themselves rather than with God, as God had planned. Now, there's two problems here. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Get out there and fill the earth and make it happen because that's important. But they said, no, we're going to stay here in the land of Shinar. We're going to make a city for ourselves. And we all speak the same language. And we're going to identify. We're going to make bricks and build things. And we're going to build a tower to the heaven and the tradition here in the Jewish literature is that they actually were seeking a rescue from another possible flood, which there are two problems with that. First of all, God said he wouldn't flood again. And secondly, you can. If God's going to do something, he's going to do something. But they are said to be people who are seeking a refuge away from the flood and seeking to make themselves kings. Now that's interesting. We go into Genesis 11 verse 5. It says, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us, Elohim, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. That is fascinating because, beloved, we learn something about God. God created languages as a judgment against the rebellion of man. God created languages as a judgment against the rebellion of man. God struck man with the confusion of languages because we are not identified by the things we make. What is the second commandment? Do you remember it? It's two places in the Bible, Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. It says, don't make idols. Don't make things that look like things that you want to worship. Don't do that. We are not identified by the things we make. We are identified by the things of God. That's very important for us to recognize and remember. That's two things that have happened. Now, we go on to Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 and 9, and we see this. Verse 8 says, So the Lord scattered them abroad around the world from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased 
building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. That's interesting. And there the Lord confused the language of the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad all over the face of the earth. Now that's interesting because we learn something here. The Lord developed our different cultures and languages. God did it, beloved. God did this to stop mankind's rebellion. Remember that God is in the process of working with man. And every single time it started with uh, having issues with demons. And now we've got issues of building buildings. What's the third issue going to be? That's going to be really interesting. So we're going to find out what that is, but we need to understand that God is moving to stop the rebellion of mankind. Because, beloved, we learn from the Bible, and I believe the Bible, that rebellion against God is always disastrous. It always ends up the worst possible situation. And I want you to know that when we come to God through Jesus Christ, as he said, that God deals with the rebellion. He says, okay, I'm going to help you now become who you were meant to be, not who you want to be, but who you were meant to be. Something important for us to remember. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television. I know that sometimes it's not easy to get interrupted and all of that, but you can come back. And if you watch us on the internet, you can just keep pause it and then come back and right. keep it going. So that's True. very, very good. Mm -hmm. And we are in our 27th year we going are. through the Bible. I'm very excited about that. I'm very excited. And because uh, I use that word a lot, excited, interesting, and fascinating. Fascinating. And fascinating. All that stuff I use Stunning. a lot. Stunning. <laughs> astounding. And all that stuff. All anyway. Right. Uh, next time on Quick Study Television, God promises to bless all the nations from Abraham's child that he does not have. Very interesting. And uh, he's going to have it, though. But that's going to be something we talk about next time on Quick Study Television. Ryan, what's up? Well, today I'm dealing with a pretty interesting alleged Bible contradiction, and it directly relates to our reading today. See, skeptics believe that Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11 contradict each other. Genesis 10, of course, is known famously as the Table of Nations, which chronicles where the descendants of Noah's three sons settled. And Genesis 11 records the famous Tower of Babel event. But skeptics ask, if people had already spread around the world as recorded in Genesis 10, why was mankind judged with a confusion of languages as recorded in Genesis 11? Let's take a closer look at this. Biblioskeptics claim that the scriptures contain many errors and contradictions and certainly could not be the word of God as it so boldly asserts. For example, the claim has been made that Genesis chapters 10 and 11 contradict each other. The accusation is that if people had already spread around the world, as recorded in Genesis 10, fulfilling God's command, then why was mankind judged with the confusion of languages as recorded in Genesis chapter 11? There are, in fact, a couple of easy solutions to this so-called contradiction. Genesis 10 is known as the Table of Nations because it traces where all the descendants of Noah's son settled after the flood. After listing the descendants of each son, the Bible states that they were dispersed according to their families and according to their languages. But if Noah and his sons all spoke the same language, where did all of these other languages come from? As one commentator points out, Genesis 11 gives us that answer. These groups of people did not willingly and obediently separate to fill the earth. Indeed, Genesis 11, 1 through 9 explains why these families separated from each other and how it came to be that there were so many languages in the world. So there is no contradiction here. 
Moses merely put the effect before the cause. Interestingly, this technique of reversing the cause and effect has been used in other history books as well. Keith Krell points out another possible reason for the switch of these events. By placing the Tower of Babel incident just prior to the stories of Abram and his descendants, he says, the biblical writer is suggesting that post-flood humanity is as wicked as pre-flood humanity. Rather than sending another worldwide catastrophe, however, God now places his hope in a covenant with Abraham as a powerful solution to humanity's sinfulness. This problem, Genesis 11, and solution, Genesis 12, are brought into immediate contrast, and the forcefulness of this structural move would have been lost had Genesis 10 intervened between the two. So we see that there's absolutely no contradiction here. Moses merely put the effect, chapter 10, before the cause in chapter 11. And as Keith Krell pointed out, this ordering of events also helps to not break the contrasting effect between chapter 11, the rebellion, and chapter 12, the solution to that rebellion, God's covenant with Abraham. This is absolutely fascinating. And we'll talk more about the Table of Nations document tomorrow. God's covenant with Abraham, that is so amazing. And as we look at it, we begin to understand that we serve a covenant God. That is a God who speaks in covenants. You know, I was thinking about this and, and Abraham is somebody who God speaks to him and he says to him, uh, as we talked about in the teaching, mm -hmm. he says, you know what, um, Abraham, I want you to go outside and look at the stars. Now, think about that. This is the God of the universe, okay? He says, I want you to go outside and look at the stars. So he does, and he says, do you count these stars? If you count these stars, you can't count them, but if you can, if you could, that's like your people are going to be. This is a man who has no child, mm -hmm. yeah. and he's old. I mean, uh, I'm 55. I cannot imagine being a, a father at the age of 100. I mean, that's incredible. And God does this amazing thing through covenants. And the covenant of Israel is here because he says, I give the people your land. That's very important. So that's interesting, Ryan. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of a covenant mm -hmm. is very important today. Yeah, very important. Absolutely. And it's really not understood because a lot of times we see it as a business deal. Mm -hmm. But it's so much more than a business deal. Business is cutthroat. You're always making sure to, to take care of yourself. But in a covenant relationship, it's really to the heart of the issue. You're looking to the other person as well for mm -hmm. their best interest. You're as obligated, well. in fact, in your covenant, you're obligated to take part in their. Uh, their well-being. Exactly, that's what covenant. I'm saying. That mm -hmm. that yeah. it, it's you're you're trying to also make sure that their best interest is in place as well. And when we come to Jesus Christ, when we come to the Lord and we say, "Lord, be my Lord," yeah. we're making a covenant. That's exactly right. That's what God did when he died on the cross and he rose again. He said, I'm going to make a covenant mm -hmm. with the people on planet right. Earth. It that reminds, it, yeah. Sorry, it reminds me of the marriage covenant as well. Well, you that's know? the other thing. I mean, you know, God did the marriage covenant. Mm -hmm. Who was the first one who did marriage on the planet? <laughs> it was God. It was God. That's right. And who was the first one who selected the bride and the groom? It was God. He, was. he made yeah. them. So. Yeah, 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 I mean, you know, <laughs> two genders and he selected it. I mean, that's the way the Bible talks about it. I believe the Bible. Anyway, the covenant is very important. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Okay, so what did you study today? Well, this clearly wasn't about a covenant, the building of the Tower of Babel. And um, I, the thought that I had in reading Genesis 11, verse 4 was, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. This was something that they were doing. It was like a business deal. We wanted to get it done. So I, my thoughts here are this, in spite of their best efforts to elevate themselves literally to God's domain, the Lord still had to come down to see the city and the tower, the scripture says, mm -hmm. God had to come down. So even though they were trying to elevate themselves, here's the point. Human attempts to achieve glory, which belongs to God alone, always, always falls pitifully short. Mm -hmm. And we learn in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's absolutely true. Pretty you know. hard lesson they had to learn here. Pride goes before destruction. Mm -hmm. I've been, you know, I've, I've lived a few things like that and it's not good. 
I think we all have. Yeah, yes, for it's sure. It's absolutely true. <laughs> anyway, I needed to ask Corey uh, some things because Corey was talking about the surrounding cultures and the, the effects of the flood. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in the Tower of Babel and the whole thing, yeah. and that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you you mentioned the the flood story, and I think that I've read somewhere somebody said to me there were 135 flood events in different cultures uh, of the oh, world. Oh, you mean the the stories? Yeah, the stories. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure of exact numbers, but that sounds about right. That's a lot of stories. It's and a lot. So this is something that if this happened, it didn't just you know, it it, it didn't just happen and we all forgot about it. I mean this this happened. Yeah. So what is the deal with this? I mean. You've got some cultures doing this. So what do you figure is the truth? Yeah. Well, uh, what's really interesting is, is that it's directly connected to the early history of Genesis. And, and the, the earlier the mythology, when you go back as, as far back as you can go, it deals with the same type of issues that Genesis deals with. Now, I don't think that's a case of borrowing, and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that it's because the farther back you go, the closer our history was as, as a human family. Uh, because we originated, of course, first from Adam and Eve, but then from Noah and his sons. And then from the Tower of Babel, we were dispersed. So everything from the Tower of Babel to before should show up if we're lucky enough to, to find uh, ancient records of it, should show up in ancient cultures. And that's exactly what mm -hmm. we're seeing. We see the Tower of Babel attested to in Mesopotamian and Babylonian different records. Mm -hmm. We see um, you know, uh, lifespans longer uh, before the flood and then after the flood. We see uh, creation mythologies that, that they're not similar enough to have been borrowed from each other it appears to be two different branches of, uh, of an event that happened. Uh, and th that branching out would have happened at the Tower of Babel because you can imagine different people as they get those languages and they're forced to do what God said in the beginning to, to, to move out and to develop their own culture. Their, their culture would develop its own system for recording or passing on its history. Mm -hmm. And its environment would affect that history if they lived in a colder environment. Well, maybe it would take on some elements that related to their survival that they would put back on to interpret their past history. So it's interesting that we see what the Bible says we should see. It's true. And you know, it's fascinating because as you look at this and as you understand it, we need to realize the Bible is real mm -hmm. and the real history and real whatever you want to call it. But God is talking to us. He sent his word and he healed them and delivered them from their destruction. You know, God sent his word to you and his word says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God promises that. And so I want to encourage you to make the Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. I did it years ago, and it works. God is real, and he will help you.